And one uh, major question which arises, which uh, always haunts the, any class of philosophy, is the decision between the two big camps of materialism and idealism. So, if we disregard some other possible candidates, how to decide? Is the substance the matter, or substance is the, sub the true substance the idea or the spirit? And um, this is, uh, is actually a question which has been posed in these terms only in the 18th century. But once it has been posed, it seemed that the whole history of philosophy was a battle between two big camps of idealism and materialism. <coughs> now, um, Hegel, as you know, is arch-idealist. If you know anything about Hegel, then you know this. And what did Hegel think of materialism? What would be his take on materialism? Um, he thought the question of materialism was immaterial. Uh, but not because he would discard matter in favor of idea, but because matter for him was just as much an idea as any other. The problem is that matter is still an idea. It's worthy of all respect. He always respected materialism. And um, I will give a quote. This is from phenomenology, but later on. He says about matter. <coughs> matter is not an existing thing, but a being in the form of a universal, or in the form of a concept. When reason interprets the moments of the, the, okay, of the law that yes, it matters, this is, a, this is from a certain part uh, from phenomenology. I won't go into this. Their essential nature has become, for reason, a universal and as such expressed as a non-sensuous thing of sense, as an incorporeal yet objective being. So he uses this very paradoxical uh, formulation. And unsinnliche sinnliche, a non-sensuous sense thing, and incorporeal but yet objective, and körperloses doch gegenständliches sein. And further he says, what is seen, felt, tasted, is not matter, but color, a stone, a salt, etc. Matter is rather a pure abstraction. And so what we are presented with here is a pure essence of thought. So this is Hegel's uh, argument about materialism. Who has ever seen matter? Nobody has ever seen matter. We, what we see are different colors, shapes, sizes. Uh, what we smell are different uh, smells. What we hear are different sounds. So we have all these sensuous materials coming from all sides. There are huge diversity, heterogeneity. And to say all this is matter, I mean, it's a major feat of thought. A major, what Hegel calls, matter is ein Gedankending. It's a thing of thought. It's a thing which has been produced by thought. It takes, it takes a great feat of abstraction to say, all this is matter. So this is why he thinks, what is the problem? I mean, I don't have a problem with this, that everything is matter, because this just means everything is an abstract idea. Matter is a very abstract idea. You need a lot of abstraction to reduce all the diversity of the world, of being, to just saying, all this is matter. And... Um, so one, can, one, cannot see, one cannot see matter. It's a pure essence of thought. But pure essence of thought to which we ascribe an objective being. So in Hegel, this is like um, uh, an infinite judgment, like thought is matter, or matter is thought. You know, you, you, immediately equate two entities which have no, seemingly have no common measure, um, which are completely heterogeneous. You put a simple equation between, between them. And this is pure thought, but which is externally existing. So we, what, we, uh, come, uh, what we observe in matter is pure thought as externally existing. And you know this was uh, Lenin's uh, criterion for what is materialism. Materialism is a stance which adopts a, the external world as objectively externally 
existing, not just uh, figment of our mind. So, on this account, of course, it's, it's objectively existing, but it, as objectively existing, it's still just an idea of our mind. It's both things. It's, a, it's existing and it's pure thought. Huh? So this is this is Hegel's um, this is Hegel's take on materialism. It's it's a very valid idea, but it's an idea. Don't fool yourself into thinking that it's something else. Huh? It's 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 an idea, just a spirit is an idea. And uh, I will just underline this. Non-sensuous, sensuous being and incorporeal uh, objectivity, because uh, this is something which this Hegel's formulation is something which recalls uh, the way that Marx will later actually qualify commodities. Uh, Marx, uh, which says uh, commodity is a sensuous, supersensuous thing, so it's also a paradox. The way that Marx is a commodity, it's, it involves this paradox of the immediate coincidence of the sensuous and supersensuous. But I won't go into this. We can go into this in, in, in the discussion. So, a matter is not a matter of senses. And what is now wrong with matter? It's not that it's material and external and, and, and sensuous, etc. What is wrong with uh, materialism for Hegel is that matter is considered a substance. So this is the wrong thing, not that it's external. But it doesn't get out of the mode of substantiality. If we just say everything is matter, then we didn't get the point of Hegel's sentence, substance is subject. So it's, for Hegel, what is wrong with materialism, it, it's, the, it's the answer to a wrong question. It's the answer to a wrong question about substantiality. It's not materialism as such that is a problem. It's equally wrong as idealism. If you say everything is an idea, you run into the same problem if you take idea to be a substance. So what we have to undo is the mode of substantiality itself. And this is what this sentence, substance subject, aims at. Now, if one would look for a certain master word of Hegel. Actually, I think there is one. It's, it hasn't been often proposed. But this master word, which he uses uh, just offhandedly, he doesn't present it as a major concept, he uses it offhandedly in the preface to phenomenology, and in German it's sich anders werden. And actually there is a very good English translation, which is self-othering. Self-othering. What is the idea of self-othering? It's sich anders werden. And this goes, it takes a self as any kind of self, zik as any kind of zik. Any, any kind of self can only become itself if it becomes other than itself. So self-othering. In order to be anything, it has to take the risk of becoming other than itself, of passing into its other. So the self is empty in itself if it doesn't take the risk of adopting the otherness, of passing into the otherness. So this is anders werden, and this goes for any entity, let's say. Any entity is empty in itself, or the origin is empty in itself, unless it takes the risk of self othering and then unless it produces the, uh, well, something that goes beyond that origin, something that negates that origin. In order to be anything at all, it has to adopt the otherness. This is, this is extremely basic Hegel stance. And why does this self, any self, do it? It doesn't do it because it's externally pushed to pass into its, into its other, because there's some external violence done to it. It's, its own, it's out of its own spring out of its own nature, let's say, or absence of nature, non-identifiable nature, the nature which can, cannot coincide with itself, that it has to, to pass into its other in order to be, to be anything at all. 
And um, one other way to, to present this idea is the idea of the fall. And Slavoj Žižek has written quite a bit about uh, the question of the fall. And you can, you can, okay, you can take the fall in the biblical sense. Like, there was a paradise, and then there is a fall from paradise. This is the narrative which is usually given. But Hegel's idea of the fall is that uh, we start with the fall. We start with the fall. And paradise, which existed before, when an entity who supposedly itself is a retroactive construction. So things have to fall in order to be themselves. I mean, they are not themselves in the supposed paradise of their self-identity. It's only after the fall that we can construct what they were supposed to be in themselves. Because before the fall, they were empty. We only retroactively have the idea of the fullness of origin. Origin for Hegel is always empty. It's the emptiest thing. It's not the full wealth from which things should then evolve. It's an empty thing, and only when we fall from this alleged paradise of uh, self-identity, let's say, only then can we retroactively see what supposedly preceded this. But uh, in our imaginary, we cannot uh, help doing a, a narrative, imagining as a narrative of some fullness of being which then fell. Um, okay. And it goes the same, this, this self othering, this fall, is uh, very much connected with this. Uh, sentence subject subject and one could say that uh, the subject is the impossibility of substance of being itself of being simply itself of being underlying eternal necessary essential universal and one so this would be a short formula subject is the impossibility of substance to be a substance to simply coincide with itself. So there's always this quirk, there's something, there's a quirk in the substance, which sort of pushes it to adopt its otherness. So there's always a, a cut, a break in this substance, which then produces its torsion. And this, the name for this torsion is, is subject. Subject is like a torsion of this substance, the fall of substance, the torsion of this substance. And uh, it doesn't mean that subject is somewhere else, that we could isolate it as a separate thing. And Hegel was always against the dualism. No? It's not that we should, if this one substance doesn't hold, then let's imagine another substance which stands in opposition to it. This was never Hegel's position. His position was that there's something inside the very idea of substance which pushes it to its, to its otherness. And um, so the subject that we, we are dealing with in this sentence, in this sentence substance is subject, is not the subject which can be opposed to objectivity. It's not a subject which would <coughs> be standing against a thing, an objective world out there. The subject is already inscribed in this objective world. It's not, it doesn't stay opposite to it, it's, it's inner torsion, it's it already <coughs> in it. And this is why, by the way, okay, I won't go into this, but, uh, you know, Kantame Su, uh, speculative realism, etc., the thing which has been around for the last 10 years or so, it's a very influential, widely spreading school, but Kanté uh, Mayasu, at some point, you know anything about this? Or is is Mayasu is right here? Okay, okay, fine. You know that Kanté Mayasu, he gives a, a, a very simple diagnosis of uh, modern philosophy, or all philosophy, particularly modern philosophy, is Kant, and this uh, diagnosis is spelled one in one word, which is correlationism. Correlationism 
there's a problem of correlationism is that we are trapped in the subject-object relation. And we cannot imagine an object which would be outside of a relation to a subject. And what he would want is what he calls le grand, le grand dehors, the big outside, which would be outside of this cage, subject-object cage. But this, um, I was kind of surprised when I read the book and also confronted him at some point in, in, on this. Hegel, Hegel was never a correlationist. He never, his subject was never something which would uh, constitute objectivity. Okay, even Kant, I think, was not a uh, correlationist, but for other reasons. But in Hegel, it's obvious that subject, substance is subject, means precisely that substance is, uh, subject is internal to the substance itself. It doesn't stand opposite to it. Um, you never have this subject-object relation as a starting point. Um, it's inscribed into, into the substance. OK. Um, now, if we, sorry, I must have jumped something. Just a moment. Um, anyway, I go back to the six uh, propositions and uh, give a Hegelian response to the six propositions in relation to space. Anything that lies in depth beyond the surface must come to the surface. So the spirit is spirit only if it risks to spread itself over the surface, Hegel says, this sentence from the preface to phenomenology. So the depth which would remain under the surface, it's not, uh, it's not a serious thing. It's an empty thing. It's only insofar as it comes to the surface that it shows its truth. So any depth must be cashed out on the surface. And there is a sort of heroism of the surface even in, in Hegel, which brings him close to Deleuze. If you read Deleuze, you know you have all this, uh, particularly in the logical sense, you have all this extolling of the surface. But you have this in Hegel as well. Second, in, uh, in relation to time, anything Eternal must uh, adopt its, um, must risk falling into the passing, falling into the passing of time. And one easy way to see this is uh, Hegel's reading of Christianity, where he, ha where he says, He who died on the cross is the, word of, is, is the God of beyond. Which means, God itself, if he was traditionally seen as a substance, must become man and die on the cross. He must come into the passing. He must take the risk of adopting finitude. Not, this is why for him Christianity was the, the last religion. Um, it's the religion where God himself becomes man and dies. And it, it's not he who dies on the cross, it's the God of beyond. I mean, he dies. He dies for real. So, um, so this is one way of seeing that anything that is considered as eternal must uh, adopt finitude and pass away. Then, um, if we think of uh, substance as, um, as something necessary as opposed to something accidental and contingent, then Hegel has this wonderful sentence that becoming contingent of essence, or the, yeah, Becoming contingent of essence. Essence can be only essence if it adopts, if it takes the risk of adopting contingency. And that, uh, it doesn't just persevere as, uh, as the essence. All, all essence must, uh, 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 must come to the fore. The necessity must become contingency, and all essence, this is the fourth point, must come to the fore. It must, it must take the risk 
of uh, appearing, of uh, adopting uh, the form of appearance. And he says again, a quote, uh, the form of appearance is as essential to essence as essence is to itself. So, what is essential, the essence that wouldn't appear would be an empty essence. It wouldn't be an essence. It's only through the appearance that we can see the force of an essence. Uh, then, as to universality, everything universal must pass into the particular and the singular. Otherwise, it's empty universality. It's, and this is what in Hegel is called mediation. Anything is, can be judged only by its mediation, no, not by what is supposed to be universally in itself. It must be mediated through the particular and the singular. And uh, as to the question of one, well, one splits into two. <laughs> to put it in the shortest formula, you know where formula stems from. One splits into two. I mean, there is no one which wouldn't in itself be already uh, an agent of split. Um, every one is an agent of split. So, in all these six counts, Hegel actually abandons the idea, the traditional idea um, of substance. And on all six counts, he tries to show that the, what Substance was supposed to be protected from, like surface versus depth. You know? Actually, it must adopt the thing from which it's supposed to be protected in order to be substance at all. It's only if it's courageous enough, if we think of substance in a courageous enough way so that it can adopt its opposite, only then can it be substance. If it perseveres as an essence, universality, oneness, unity, etc., somewhere beyond the, the divergence of appearances, then it's not a true substance. It's a bad kind of substance. Yeah? So everything depends now on this mediation. It's passing in its other. Every substantial trait must undergo the self-uttering, the sich anders werden. 